Acts chapter 1, uh, let's just start reading in verse 1. Uh, the former treatise, Have I Made, O Theophilus? Let me ask you tonight, where, where do you hear the name Theophilus? What other book in the New Testament tells us about Theophilus? Luke. Luke. And that's what he's referring to here. Uh, of all that Jesus both began to, to, to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be, uh, be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore thy, uh, again thy, the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye ga gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then, they, uh, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olive, Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Let's just stop there and have a word of prayer. Now, Father, thank you so much for the message of song that we've heard tonight that has been a blessing and challenged our hearts. And Lord, these that were mentioned uh, for prayer earlier, we ask that in each case your will be done. We pray now as we look at uh, especially one verse in this passage that you would use it, uh, Lord, to challenge us and really to help us to see where we stand before you in this certain area. We ask that Christ would be honored and glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this, this morning in Acts, in John chapter 20, you remember we were uh, looking at what happened the night of the day of the resurrection. So now if we fast forward those 40 days, this is at the time when now the Lord has finished the 40 days that he walked on this earth after the resurrection and he'll be taken back up into heaven. All right, and so with that in mind, and, and let me just remind us, these men, though they, I'm sure they thought they were not prepared, these men were prepared for what the Lord has put before them. You know, they had walked with him for the last couple of years of their lives. They had seen him in what he did. And you know something else? They had a promise from day one. Matthew 4, 19, the Lord said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He was going to take them from being, many of them, just fishermen, and he would he, through teaching and experiences that they would share with him, they would become fishers of men. It's interesting when you look through the Gospels and you begin to see some of the lessons that the Lord taught them along the way to prepare them. And some of the events that they went through really just to be taught some things. One is in John chapter 4. 
uh, don't turn there, we're ju but just that's the woman at the well. And you know the first verse is that uh, the Lord said he must needs go through Samaria. And granted it was to uh, see that, person, that lady come to Christ, but you know there was a lesson at that well for the, his disciples as well. Uh, we may look at that on another night. But anyway, here, notice in verse 6, uh, the, uh, the conversation between the Lord and uh, the disciples. Uh, they ask of him in verse 6, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You know, they still weren't quite sure how things were going to unfold. They had no idea that the restoration of the kingdom would be about 2,000 years out in front of them. Uh, I don't fault them for it. In fact, like I said this morning, I believe that this time this was, there were still some things they thought, I'm sure they wanted to say, Lord, we still have some questions about some things, you know. Not to question him or his authority, but just how this is all going to work out. Here they were, and something else, they were Jews. And then been given a command to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. Just different things here. Think about uh, in this question of theirs. First, the subject of, of their inquiry was about the kingdom. Now, this tells us a couple of things. They had some knowledge of the kingdom. You could go to the Old Testament prophets for that. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, one that we know well. Uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But there it speaks about the government upon his shoulder. Now when we look at that verse, and granted we, we know, but in that verse there's actually about, as I said, 2,000 years between the child being born and the son given and the government being upon his shoulder. And these men, while they in all probability knew Isaiah, his writings. I, I know they knew his writings in that verse, but uh, they didn't realize, again, at that point, this, this parentheses time that Paul writes about also when, uh, in Romans when uh, he answers the question, but what about the Jew? But they didn't understand it, that in the, Lord's, uh, in the Lord's plan. And then also... Uh, at the timing, they said, Will thou at this time establish the kingdom? Once again, the, their question here wasn't their, their lack of, of confidence in the Lord, but their question was just, Is this the time? They didn't understand the timing. And then third, uh, the, it really shows the confidence they had in him because they did say, Will thou at this time? They knew he could do it. Now that's something because he had just been crucified. They'd seen him rise from the dead 40 days earlier. And you know, maybe it was just that resurrection and really showing them, as, as he tells John later when, uh, in, uh, I guess almost to the end of that first century, we, we read in Revelation where he says that, uh, you know, I have the keys to death and hell. Uh, I guess these men knew, my, if he can come back from the grave, he can establish his kingdom. And so they trusted in his power to do that. But then look at the Lord's response to them. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. If I brought that to a phrase we hear sometimes now... Uh, he would say, guys, that's need to know, and you're not, you don't need to know. Not at this time. You don't need to know. He but notice, too, he did not deny it. He didn't tell them, no, there's not going to be a future kingdom. Now, you know, as you look at that, granted, you can't build the doctrine right there on that verse, but it does let us know that that was in the plan of God. It's just not at this time. 
And so he didn't deny the fact. And then uh, second, we see that uh, he informed who was really in the authority. He said, which the Father hath put in his own power, in verse 7. Now in this passage, there are two words used for power. And, and here, when he, uh, in verse 7, when he says, when the uh, which the Father hath put in his own power, that speaks of, of the enablement or that of the, the strength or, or whatever in, in that sense, his power. In other words, there was no worldly or worldly government that could stop him from doing what he wanted to do. In fact, we know that Daniel tells us he sets up kingdoms, he takes them down. And I hope you, you listen really to what your pastor said. I've told our, our church that many times, what he said this morning, and I still have some fellas that, and I appreciate their, their loyalty, their patriotism, but America's hope is not in any party, religion, uh, uh, political party, and it's not in any one man. In fact, I think sometimes what we see, we're, uh, you can't have an Antichrist come on the scene if there is a superpower of a nation on this globe. And really, when you think about it, uh, we've seen the last few uh, with the exception of the uh, the one man, Trump, uh, we've seen uh, uh, presidents that actually help to to weaken us as a nation. Amen. But could that not be possible? That, could it be possible that God's using that? You know, really, uh, I know we like to sing at baseball games, God bless America, or, or whatever, but... Uh, we ought to be crying out, God have mercy on us, without a doubt. But you know, in, in God's prophetic calendar, maybe all this has to come to pass. I think sometimes, uh, well, now, like I say, we, we got saved in the mid-70s, or yeah, mid-70s. And so from that time, right, and right away, we heard about the second coming of Christ. And you know, over the years, I, I think sometimes that as Americans, we've had the idea that uh, we're going to have a, a good, stable economy. We're going to be comfortable living and, uh, you know, all these kind of things and, and uh, our retirement plans are going to be, you know, they're just going to be growing for us and all this. And the rapture takes place and then things get bad. Uh, I don't really think it's going to work out that way. No, I think we'll have to see our nation brought to its knees. Sometimes people say, well, look, where's America in Bible prophecy? It's mentioned when it talks about the nations of the earth. That's all we are. We're a Gentile nation. We must remember that. We didn't, we're not the replacement of Israel or anything. We are a Gentile nation that God has blessed abundantly. But when any nation turns their back on the Lord, uh, He's not obligated to bless them, to protect them, or anything. But anyway, that, that's getting way off track. I'm sorry for that. But, but anyway, He says here that it's in the Father's power. But then in the next verse, verse 8, but ye shall receive power. Now that's a different word. It's not like the strength, it's authority. John 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power. It's the same word there. The authority to be called the sons of God. Here he says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now I want us tonight just to take a few minutes uh, and look at this verse. We'll review it from what you've had recently uh, here in your church. 
but review it in light of, too, our mission conference. Now granted, there's much focus, there'll be much said about uh, faith promise this week. That's your opportunity to be involved or get involved in a greater way in God's plan of getting the gospel to nations around the world and to have a part in it. And as I said this morning, when you give, you're giving of your life. Not in the sense that the missionaries do. But when you give financially, that's money that you work to earn. And so in that sense, you are giving of your life. Paul talks about it in the book of Philippians. He, he thanks God for them and their fellowship in the gospel. Now, we as Baptists, we know last night was fellowship. That's what we call it. We love to eat. And uh, somebody has said, if we're meeting, we're eating. And I, I guess that's about it. But you know that really in Scripture, fellowship is this joining together. And granted, I'm not saying we shouldn't have times together and we could call it fellowship. But really it speaks of joining together, laboring together. And Paul said to that church at Philippi, he thanked God for them and they're laboring together with him in carrying the gospel. In fact, when you read the little book of Philippians, it's actually a prayer letter because Paul, uh, you know, uh, I, actually in chapter 4, he, he thanks them for the, the offering they had sent and also he gives them an update in chapter 1. But then too, he's the man that God used to start that church and so it's a letter back to the church uh, to exhort them in some areas as well. But still, uh, is he talks about them laboring together with him. And again, some of the verses that we know so well, he says that not, it's not that he desires the gift, but he desires fruit that may abound to your account. You know, again, you may have a financial, you know, a, 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 a retirement plan or whatever, and as you give, granted, it's, it's fruit that you hope is going to abound as you get older and it will be there when you get old enough to draw from it. But Paul talks about a plan that really it will abound and do you know what? It's not subject to uh, inflation or, or any of those things. It goes into an account in heaven. Not, not those dollars literally but the fruit from it. The people that have been saved. You look at the kids and the adults that you saw in this presentation. You've had a part in that. And you should rejoice in it. And every time you have a service here, you should remember in all probability, though it might be the different season, uh, right now, let's see, the McKinney's, are going into actually uh, the the fall and the, the colder weather you know not so many bugs around I guess and that's about it but still uh, about the same time zone when you have services they will as well and some other of the missionaries as well some are ahead of you in, a, in their time zone some are behind and things like that but listen every Sunday you're not just getting the gospel right here. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you think already of this church, your outreach around the world. That's not to just sit back and, and, and be proud about it, but at the same, same time, you should glory in it. What God is doing. And look for Him to give increase in that way. But anyway, tonight here in... So there's going to be much said about... Uh, uh, faith promise. But I want to get on another subject as well in this. And that's what we see in verse 8. We mentioned this morning when the Lord he, uh, said, as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. Or, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Uh, the fact that we are all to go. But look what he says here. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, 
both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I want to ask you a couple of questions uh, just examining that verse. Should I take that literally? I think it should be literal. Taken literally. In fact, we see this verse uh, played out, so to speak, as we look through or read through and study through the book of Acts. And you see how God did it. You know, he began in, in uh, Jerusalem. But then we see that by chapter 8, there was the, the, uh, the uh, uh, help me with the word, uh, the, 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 when the Jews came on them and, and uh, you know, oh my, wait till you get my age. Persecution, thank you brother. Thank you whoever gave me that, I needed that. Uh, but anyway, when the persecution came uh, and they were scattered abroad, it's interesting, everybody was scattered abroad but the apostles. And then we know just, for, uh, just the different chapters as we read through. And we see the, the center of activity be transferred from Jerusalem up to Antioch. And, and what took place in Antioch. And things like that. And, and you see this played out. Well, that's, that's good that we understand that. But did it really stop with them? Do you know there's some that say, well, no, this was fulfilled with the disciples or the apostles. Was it really? Look over in, in 1 Thessalonians. I'm just going to look at one reference here, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul writing back to the believers there and he said in verse 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. As you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us, imitators of us. And of the Lord, having received the word uh, in much affliction with joy in the Holy, of the Holy Ghost, so that you were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not speak any, any uh, to, we need not to speak anything. What's he talking about there? Their witness. Man, their witness was going out. That was a local church where their witness was going out, not just in their area. So we could look at some other verses if, if we had time, but going back to Acts chapter 1, I see that it wasn't just the, gener uh, the generation, if we put it like this, of the disciples, the apostles. It didn't end with them. We see here that this is God's plan. So is it addressed to me? I believe this is a, a perpetual command. Yes, even down to our time and our, the di different generations that are even present here tonight. It's a, a perpetual command just like Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. This is God's plan for this age. And it should continue until the rapture takes place. And so, uh, if it's God's plan, and it's perpetual, that means then, I should look at this verse and realize, with, with one exception here, he says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. All right, well, let me ask you, well, has that taken place in your life? Now, there's some that would say, no, not yet. I'm, I'm praying through, trying to... No, at the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit makes His entrance into your life. Preacher, I didn't feel it. It's not a feeling. But it's a scriptural truth. You see, He's the earnest. <clears throat> Pardon me. He's the down payment. He's the proof of your salvation. He's the one that has been teaching you from the moment of conversion. He's the one at your, at your lowest hour can bring to mind verses that can encourage your heart. He's the one that just out of nowhere, you're driving down the road or, and, and all of a sudden a song 
And I'm not talking some old country western thing or anything. I'm talking about a good uh, spiritual hymn comes to your mind. <clears throat> and just fills your heart. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace, be still. In along life's ebb and flow. Yeah, they come to your mind. And can encourage you, can strengthen you. He'll bring verses to your mind and all of a sudden you just, as you muse on that verse, He begins to give you more understanding of what it means. You'll find yourself in different situations in your home and the Spirit of God brings to your mind instruction that you've received so that you'll be able to, to respond correctly in different situations. You see, these things are the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. So do I need to wait do I need to tarry? That was given to those in that time period between the end of the 40 days and that 10 days later on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. And that's when Pentecost was come, the Comforter came. And from that moment forward, He indwells every believer at the moment of conversion. And do you know what? He stays with you until you leave this life, either by death or by the rapture. So, in that part of the verse, I know that's already taken place. And perhaps you that have witnessed at different times to people, uh, you've experienced it. Not in some overwhelming way, but all of a sudden you realize as you're trying to talk to this individual about Christ, Verses are coming to your mind. And being able to actually answer his, the person's questions. I mean, there are verses that are coming to your mind to help answer the questions and things like that. And you find yourself in a conversation and, and part of you is saying, you know, where is, where is all this coming from? This ability to talk to this individual. It's the working of the Holy Spirit of God. I look back in my own life. Uh, Judy and I uh, were engaged in February of 1975. I wasn't saved. Uh, neither was Judy. And I had uh, a young lady. Her father was a Pentecostal preacher. Was uh, the secretary. And so... Quite frankly, uh, I, was, I was 25 at the time, and so uh, I'd graduated, gone to a couple of years of college, went through the military, and during that time frame, several of my friends had, had already been married, and they were on a divorce and things like that, and I didn't want mine to end up that way, so I asked this girl, I said, how do I know if this is really the girl that God wants me to marry? And she said, well, you just pray and God will show you. And honestly, at night, I did pray, you know. But then one day I asked another lady that uh, uh, it, she worked in a different section. And uh, I asked her, I said, now, I asked Kay this, and she tells me all I've got to do is pray. And this lady, who was uh, quite a bit rougher around the edges, but still she goes, well, Mr. Landers, are you saved? Because if you're not saved, God's not going to hear your prayer. And I said, well, yeah, I've been baptized. She said, I'm not talking about baptism. And I was her boss. And she began to, as we say, lowered the gospel gun. And said things to me, not being rude or anything else, but just blunt truth. And not trying to trip her up, but there were several times... This went on for, uh, I guess, maybe a couple of weeks, but there were times I'd ask her a question, and you know what she told me? She said, I, I'm not sure of the answer. 
but I'll get back with you. And she'd go to her, her husband or her pastor. That Her and her husband were young Christians, really. But uh, And then she'd come back and she'd have an answer to my question from Scripture. And you know, who was it that enabled that lady to really be a witness when, when, now I opened the door, but when I opened it, she definitely stuck her foot in there and just kept it open. Who was it that would do that? You know, really, we, we knew each other, but we didn't. She didn't know what was going on in my life. And so she witnessed to me, and it was really over the course of at least two weeks. And then she invited me out to church for Easter Sunday. And I really didn't commit to it, but I went into town that morning, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to church. And, and so I went into town, and uh, this was a town down in North Carolina, and I'd noticed there was a, a Methodist church, had brass, big brass rails out front and stuff like that. Looked like a pretty church. And I thought, you know, I'll just go there. It's Easter Sunday. I'll go there. And I, I'll never forget, I pulled up and parked in front of it, and... Something came to my mind, and, and I thought, no, I'm not going to go there. Now, Judy and I had attended uh, a Methodist church up in uh, Virginia Beach. That's where she lived, and, and uh, we'd go there. And I liked it because I got out early. There was no pressure in it, and I could go home and watch the football game and, and do what I wanted to do. Basically, that's it. So, But I was in church. And I, I don't want to belabor this, but, but anyway, instead of going in there, I, Janice had given me directions. I went out to their church, an independent Baptist church, and typical independent Baptist church. It was cinder blocks. They were in a building program. I got there, and uh, they did have the front door in, but then it, they didn't even have carpet yet and things like that, you know. But still, I, I went in and sat about the second row on, on the right side. And uh, a fellow preached. They had a guest speaker that day, and, and when he preached and he was done, uh, I, I knew... I was going to hell. And it wasn't even so much what he said. I just, there, were, there was a heavy burden on my heart. I knew if I died, I was going to hell. But then I thought, but how do I know if this is really the right place? I'd been brought up in a Baptist church, so I kind of figured it was, But how would I know? How do I know? And, you know, just, and then I was thinking, what about my friends? What are they going to say? Because I knew. <laughs> I mean, they just. I said, what would my friends think, you know, about this? And, and you know, the fellow, the, the preacher, just, he said, don't worry about what your friends would say. And uh, I, I struggled with it. I had my head down and my grip in the pew in front of me. And then finally, you know, I stepped out came forward and Janice's husband Chuck met me there and showed me just a couple of verses and he said now you pray in your words and you ask the Lord to save you I said Lord, I don't know how to pray. Because I didn't. I'm sure I'd been taught as a child, but I mean, I was a long way away from those things. But I, I knew that I was lost, and I knew I needed a Savior. And just, I asked Him to forgive me and save me. And about that time, my body started flailing all up. No, it didn't do that. You know what? As far as physically, you couldn't see any difference. And, and I didn't see anything. 
But you know what? When I got up, the burden was gone. I didn't understand it at the time. But for the first time in my life, I was at peace with God. And you know, therefore, if anything be in, if any, uh, be in Christ, he's a new creature. Honestly, things did change. Changed quickly. Judy, as I said, we were engaged. And uh, I told her over the phone, I said, you know, something's taking place in my life, or I forget how I put it. I was afraid to really tell her what, because I thought she's going to think I'm a fanatic and I'll never see her again. I wanted to at least be able to talk to her. And so, um, went up that weekend. Actually, my brother got married. My younger brother got married on that Saturday. I didn't go to the bachelor party Friday night. Uh, and just because, you know what, I figured, no, I'm, I'm too weak. And if I get back in, because we kind of ran with some of the same guys, I said, if I get in with them, I know what's going to end up, and I didn't want it to take place. So the next day, went to the, the wedding, and uh, Sunday morning, uh, Judy and I went to uh, Tabernacle there in Virginia Beach. And... It's interesting. I didn't know that the Lord had been working in her heart. And that morning, uh, when the invitation was given, she, she went forward. And uh, Jane Thompson, one of the assistant pastors there, his wife, led her to Christ. And you know, God began to do things in our lives. Different things. My point with that is I began to see the Holy Spirit working. I didn't know all of what that was. The place where I, I worked for, it was a private company, but I, I managed, I actually, I was opening and going to manage, it was um, a hotel. A hotel chain. Well, after I got saved, then we got married. Uh, still working there, and they decided they were going to put a bar in. Now there was somebody over the restaurant, and actually they would be over the bar, but I was I was the general manager over the property, and I'd prayed about that, and so uh, I wrote the comp the owner of the company who was supposed to be a Christian. And I told him, I said, that I'd become a Christian and I would not be able to stay and oversee a property with a bar on it. And I gave him 30 days notice. Do you know they tried to expedite uh, the, the shipment or, or the purchase of the furniture for the bar and actually, we're planning on trying to open it by the middle of the month. Well, uh, I, I went to the pastor and I, I said, what am I going to do? I've given a notice, and I, but I don't want to stay if they're going to have the bar open. He said, just pray. And so we did, and, and the bar furniture got lost in shipment. My, my last day, the fellow that had come down from the main office, he was going to be there until they, they you know, hired somebody new. And, and so we were walking around just showing him different things because it was a new, brand new property. Some things weren't functioning yet and things like that. And we walked around and came back to the front, the front office. And I said, well, I told him, I said, Ed, if you need, if there's a question about something, just call me and things like that. And uh, I looked out front, and there at the front door, 
it looked like the Beverly Hillbillies truck. You know how, I mean, just stuff sticking out everywhere. And I said, it looks like you've got a group of, I won't say what, uh, gypsies. I, uh, well, I hope yeah, they can delete that if it's offensive. But anyway, uh, it looks like you've got a group of something that's just pulled in for rooms tonight. And he goes, no, wait a minute. That's the bar furniture. Now, I apologize, but still, when I think about those things, it's amazing, pardon me, that God would save me. And it's amazing that two young people, all we wanted to do was serve the Lord. And how he could intervene even in things like that. To, I mean, I, I walked out to my car and got on the property, or got in and drove off for the last time as Ed walked over to, to talk about the whatever the, he, whatever he talked to about the bar furniture being there. And I went from there to vacation Bible school that the church was having. You know, and so I know the Spirit of God can be real in a person's life. And you know something else? When the Holy Spirit comes in, He He can change you if you'll let Him. And you know what? It doesn't have to be the pastor. He's not going to arm twist you. He'll give you truth, but He doesn't do the changing. Uh, Anyway, let's get back to here. How do I apply this formula? All right, if this is my, the command, this is, listen, this is God's command to me as I live in Northeast Maryland. I've received power. The Holy Ghost has come upon me. And now I'm to be a witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, does it, do I have to travel to the Middle East? No. Jerusalem, that's my community. That's where I'm to be a witness. And then Judea, that's all the way over like we were talking this morning. That'd be even over into Harford County. That'd be when we come this way to shop because you've got tax-free shopping. You know, we can be a witness that way. It's that community around you. And then it's Samaria. That was a neighbor company. Now, I wonder how that set with the Jewish men and, and ladies there that day. Because why? John 4 tells us the Samaritan lady, uh, woman said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. And now here's the Lord saying, okay, you're to be a witness in Samaria. What group is that? That's the group that I come into contact that there's an innate uh, not hostility but prejudice against. You understand what I'm saying there? We could I could ask you a couple of questions and I will and I I hope I don't cause an issue with uh, what you're streaming, but but you know, what if you go in and, and you go into a store, you're going to buy gas or something like that, and you see behind the counter a Middle Eastern person, would you give them a gospel track? You should. What about some of these that are coming into the country illegally? Am I for that? No, they ought to come in illegally. But you know what? When they get here as illegals, uh, the, it's the government's. It, they're supposed to find out, you know, as far as if they need to be deported and things like this. It, when, when one like that comes in, it's my responsibility to be a witness to them. You see, my Samaria 
are what we might call the foreigners. My Samaria are those that are different than me, that somehow I feel, uh, you know, they shouldn't be here, whatever it might be. It, my Samaria is the people that, though I don't like to talk about it, I am prejudiced toward. Amen. That's true. You know, we will send money so missionaries can go there, but keep them there. No, we're at a point where God many times brings them right here. We're out in a rural area. And let's see, I guess it was two weeks ago on a Sunday morning, we, well, we have a man from Ghana that's been coming, and uh, he's not here legally, but he's been coming to church. He's coming to church because one of the ladies, almost a year ago, <coughs> I preached a message, I don't know what it was, but challenged people to take tracts that week. And so she had tr gospel tracts with her. This fellow was in you know, a grocery store and let her go in front of him. And so she determined she wanted to give him a gospel track. Uh, they got separated kind of as they're going out of the store. And she tracked him down in the parking lot and gave him a gospel track. Almost a year later, he comes walking in the church. And he'd been, he's been coming last, I guess the last month or so. He's not saved, but he comes. And uh, also there was a, a young fella, probably from Mexico, I didn't get to really talk to him a lot, but he was a waiter at a restaurant uh, there in Rising Sun. And another couple had given him a gospel track. And you know what? He, he came. And it turns out he's Roman Catholic and he's reading his Bible. Now he started in Genesis, but he wants to read the Bible through. He said, we've never had the Bible in my home. And so he's trying to read the Bible through. And I was able to talk to him a few minutes after the service. And, uh, you know, just about some different things. Want to get back with him and begin to have a Bible study if possible. But the thing is, Samaria, that's those, they're near us, and yet they're different than us. Do you understand? And then he says, it goes on, Samaria, and not just Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth that's here. That's these. You'll notice when you read the verse again, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this many times before, it says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, first, in Jerusalem. Does it say that? No, it says both. What is both? Both means simultaneously. We are to be a witness simultaneously in all of these areas. I'm to be a witness in Northeast and Cecil County and in the surrounding area. And at the same time, I'm to be a witness in all these different countries. That's what God said. This is his command. All right. So as we look at it, in closing, let me just ask you, so how are you doing on obedience to the Lord to Acts 1.8 how many people have once again as I said this morning have I witnessed to this past week or have I given a gospel track and granted I can say you know would like to invite you to church that's, that's good but you know something else I'd like to give you this this message changed my life. We have one that has peace on the front and then inside is the plan of salvation. I like to give you this because this, is, this will tell you how you can have peace in a mixed up world. But how many have you given out this week? If none, what's your plan for this coming week? Maybe as you pray for faith promise, maybe too, say, dear God, help me to remember to put some gospel tracts in, in my pocket, in my purse, and, and when I go out, to look for people 
that I could be a witness to. You know, so many times we're like the disciples when they went into that village in Samaria. They went in, bought a couple of hoagies, and came back out. They bought them from Samaritans. They had to go, you know, do all that. But they went in and came out really oblivious to the harvest that was right there. Could it be that you and I rubbed shoulders with somebody this past week that if we'd been alert and been sensitive to the Holy Spirit leading us, it could be somebody that really we could have taken the time to sow the seed of the Word of God into their heart. Maybe not actually lead them to the Christ that, at that moment, but to allow the speed, uh, Spirit of God to use the seed and see it germinate with fruit in the future. Am I praying for the salvation of somebody outside my family or extended family? Who is it that you pray for that's not related to you? Is it a co-worker? Is it a neighbor? And you say, well, I'm not really praying for anybody's salvation. Why don't you look around? We all rub shoulders with unsaved people. And when you do, don't be afraid to, to bow the knee and say, Dear God, would you save so-and-so? You tell us it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Use me, Father, as a witness to them. Over the years as pastor, on a number of occasions, I've been asked by members of the church, uh, so-and-so is at the point of death. Would you go talk to them? And I will, but somewhere along the line later, I want to ask that person, when did you talk to them? Don't, don't expect me to go rushing in at the last moment in every case and, and be able to witness to them and see them come to Christ when you've had perhaps years to speak to them and you never have. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not mean and mean, but I am being trying to be blunt. Not just to be offensive either, but it's time we wake up to things like that. Do you know that often if we would just listen in the conversation? I was talking to a fellow the other day. And he wasn't saved, but he said something about how things are just, this world is going crazy. Now, if you're a Christian, he just opened the door for you. It sure is. But I'm so glad, I'm so glad that I can still lay my head down at night and have peace in my life. I'm so glad that though it's going crazy, I do know what awaits me in the future. You know, there are plenty of people, they may be rough looking, and you may think they're, they're hard, and maybe they are to some extent. But you know, things going on in our country are breaking people, given opportunities. So who have you witnessed to? Who do you pray for that's lost? If you haven't witnessed, if you haven't hand, handed out a tract, what will you do tonight to determine, dear God, help me this next week? Granted, while I'm praying about faith promise, and you do that, but here he says both simultaneously, Lord, help me to change the way I view every day. Help me to be the witness that I should. In giving out a track, in, in giving a witness, and then also involved in praying. Praying for an unsaved friend, co-worker, whatever it might be. You see, that's my personal outreach to that Jerusalem. 
these missionaries, the McKinneys are reaching people that geographically you cannot reach. But you're here and you can reach people that geographically they cannot reach. And as I said, when we read Philippians, it talks about being co-laborers. And granted, you're a co-laborer as you finance, help to finance their ministry there in, in Bolivia, but co-labor in, in the same sense that you're doing, you're being the witness here that you should. Now, I know sometimes Christians will just kind of, somehow we think that this is an area of my Christian life that it's okay if I just disregard. Not so. Again, Matthew 4.19, the Lord Jesus said to the disciples, Follow me and I'll make you uh, fishers of men. You know, one of the marks that I'm following the Lord Jesus is a concern for souls. That's what he said, not me. Again, I didn't... I don't mean to come in here and beat you over the head or browbeat you, but you know what? I do want to stir your hearts. And I do think that, oh, if ever there was a time that you and I needed to get serious about being a witness and get serious about seeing people come to Christ, it's now. It's now. I hear sometimes, and I hear from people in my church, hearts are hard. Yeah, they are. And maybe in some ways it's nothing more than the gleanings. But you know what? Hearts are hard, but people are still getting saved. We've had... Uh, this isn't great, great, but... It's great for us. We've had two uh, ladies, two moms, different families and stuff, but uh, that have been saved and been baptized this year. One's a single mom. Her life was really messed up, and uh, she she knew. She said, she said she started praying, God, get me out of this mess. And she even started reading her Bible, but she said she realized as she read her Bible, it pointed her to Christ. She got saved, and uh, she'll text Judy, or she'll text me, and sometimes it's late at night with questions and things like that. She's got a little girl that... Uh, She's a pistol, man, but she's, uh, Wednesday night, she'll be all over the place. I tell her, don't worry about it. It's fine, you know. But still, she's, she's growing. We've got some others that we desire to see saved. You know, God can do that. And you know what? He can use you. Maybe you've never led somebody to Christ. I'd challenge you. Say, dear God, use me. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Let's pray.